with Professor Johnson here uh, immediately to my left. Uh, he perhaps need, needs no introduction as our master of ceremonies here today. <laughs> Uh, but nevertheless, I'll tell you a little bit more about him. Uh, he is the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Professor of Law here at uh, the University of Utah S.J. Queeney College of Law. He joined the faculty here in 2008 after serving 13 years at Loyola University Chicago Law School. He publishes extensively on corporate finance and derivatives, having written four books and more than 36 articles on these topics. Professor Johnson testified before Congress in 2009 on the regulation of derivatives. He has been a frequent speaker on the financial crisis and corporate finance at institutions including the IMF, the American Bar Association, the Futures Industry Association, the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and a variety of, acad of academic institutions abroad, such as the University of Hong Kong, the National University of Singapore, Osgoode Law School, and the University of Johannesburg. He has been a senior lecturer at the University of Melbourne and an academic consultant for the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. As, um Jeff mentioned the, the name of this particular panel is assessing the legislative and regulatory answers to economies in crisis. And, and one thing we're trying to explore a little bit is, is what is the appropriate role for the government to deal with, uh, with situations and have we been successful or not. Um, my particular topic is, is, is perhaps looking backward and, and to talk a little bit about assessing just how did the Federal Reserve in particular do when, uh, when everything truly went wrong in September of 2008? And, and also to perhaps uh, sensitize and discuss just how big that intervention was. And I, I think that's one thing that's gotten a little bit lost. We talk a lot about the, the Bush stimulus and, and the Obama stimulus and Treasury's TARP program. But, but one, of the, one of the great stories of, of the crisis is uh, Bernanke's actions as head of the Federal Reserve in, in trying to deal with uh, an absolutely catastrophic uh, credit crisis that was occurring as uh, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt and all the other things that were going on in, in that time. Um, so what I'd like to do is describe the extent of, of their intervention basically from September of, uh, of, of 08 through mid-2009, uh, essentially, is where they, where they really did a lot of their, their actions. And, and kind of the question I pose is, um, is, boy, am I glad that the Federal Reserve was there when, when they were needed. But the question is, do I really want them to have the power to do it again? You know, the question is, were we lucky that we had a, a man like Bernanke who, uh, who understood uh, exactly what needed to be done and how to do it, and who managed to pull off a somewhat miraculous, uh, extraordinary uh, monetary intervention into the U.S. credit markets and world credit markets, uh, uh, for that matter. Uh, do I want them to have that much power again? Uh, that's, that's sort of a question that's still unanswered. There's been some, as we'll talk, there's been some curtailing of the, the Fed's power um, there's a serious argument, though, that they could do a lot of the stuff that they, they did during that particular uh, time period. Um, you know, you call it September madness. September of 08 was, was one of the most extraordinary uh, periods in, in my career, uh, watching on a daily basis all of the things that were going wrong in our, our economy. We have Fannie Mae and and Freddie Mac, both essentially trillion dollar institutions and assets uh, being nationalized by the federal government. Uh, we have the Lehman Brothers uh, bankruptcy, the, the largest um, uh, bankruptcy in U.S. history. I, I forget if GM was probably close to that. We had the uh, AIG uh, failure. We had huge runs on the money markets and on commercial paper. A lot of this was, was sort of under the radar of, of most people. And uh, it's hard to understand the stock market now is at, uh, at 14,000. Uh, look at the Dow. It was about that in, um, I think, October of 2007. It was at about that same level. I think we forget that in March of 2009, we had gone down to about half of that value. Essentially, temporarily anyway, the, the stock market had lost half of its value. And it was just an extraordinarily frightening time period. Um, when you talk to investment bankers and people who were uh, 
in, who had power to do something at that particular time, they, they seriously wondered if they had lost complete control of their financial system and were, were really very concerned that, they, uh, that they, we weren't going to pull out of it. Um, you see, almost, you, you see um, Bernanke and uh, um, the woman at the FDIC and Hank Paulson and Geithner all saying that basically there is nothing we will not do to uh, try and salvage the, uh, the financial system. And what I'd like to show you are some numbers that that really show they, they meant that and they did that. And, uh, and we don't know what would have happened had they not intervened quite in the way that they, uh, they did. Uh, the Federal Reserve is an interesting institution. It has the power to uh, lend money and it has the power to, um, to buy at least, clearly has the power to buy U.S. Treasury securities and, uh, and mortgage-backed securities as we're talking about. Doesn't have the power to buy equity, uh, you know, make equity investments like the uh, the U.S. Treasury did. But this lending power was very, very important during the the crisis. Um, this particular one, we, we call this discount window lending. This is where the Federal Reserve actually lends directly to uh, to banks. And what's really interesting is that at the at the, at the peak of the crisis, which is this bottom number here which I, I consider to be March of, of 09, the Federal Reserve was directly lending to banks uh, $493 billion. That was what was outstanding uh, on that particular date. And of course, that, that $500 billion number was fairly constant. And, and essentially, uh, when you looked at banks needing credit, you know, banks have to borrow uh, just like any other companies do, and nobody was lending to banks except for the Federal Reserve, and also there's a, another funny institution called Federal Home Loan Banks that we don't talk about very much, but that was literally the only source of credit for community banks, Zions Bank, any banks in the, uh, in the country, and, and this number is really, a, I mean, that's really a very, very large number. Um, what's interesting, though, is the banks have paid it all back, and the Fed, and then they've basically exited out of doing this massive kind of uh, discount wind window uh, lending that they were doing uh, uh, during the crisis. I don't know what the banks would have done had the Fed not been, um, been out there to provide that, that kind of uh, credit. Another interesting problem, everyone started to hoard U.S. dollars outside of the country, and, and you could not borrow U.S. dollars outside of the United States. It was very, very hard to do that. And central banks outside of the U.S., they, they didn't have dollars to lend. And, and, and as, as a lot of you are aware, an enormous number of transactions are done in dollars. Almost all uh, oil transactions are denominated in dollars. Um, and there were simply no, no dollars to buy. And the Fed introduced what we call a swap program where they, they swapped about $600 billion of U.S. currency for foreign currencies. And again, a very, very large number. Now, it was always, you know, when the Fed does action, it's always collateralized, but they would take yen and uh, euros and, uh, and pound sterling back in exchange for giving the central banks uh, a dollars. Um, that balance has now basically gone to zero. Uh, there, there still is some minor, these, what we call these swaps going on, but it's, it's not at the $600 billion mark like was going on at that particular uh, time. Something that was, that was very controversial and, uh, and a topic that, that, that still promotes a lot of concern, that they actually were lending to non-banks. Um, non and you can see the numbers got, got very, very large as you're looking at. They had funny names, uh, Maiden Lane. Maiden Lane is actually the address of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And they called a lot of these facilities that they were uh, that they were dealing with. But you had you had very large loans being made to uh, Bear Stearns. To uh, we had some, we had a lot of lending that went on to AIG, and and, um, and we had potentially had some lending that, that might have happened to Citibank and to uh, the Bank of America. These are what we call the the Section 13.3 powers that the Federal Reserve had. And they came in in a very big way to try and save what we, we consider to be systemically important institutions at this particular time. 
Um, again, the numbers are, are, are so large, it's, it's very, very interesting to what was, uh, was going on at, at that particular instance. Um, one thing that doesn't get much attention are what we call these liquidity facilities, again, that were lent to, uh, to non-banks, something the Fed doesn't do and can only do through this Section 13.3. Section 13.3 refers to a power in the Federal Reserve Act that gives them the power to lend to to non-banks under, uh, under exigent and important uh, circumstances. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the commercial paper market essentially collapsed uh, during, this, during September madness of 08. Um, you see $350 billion being, uh, basically the Fed went in and bought up commercial paper uh, in an effort to, to provide some liquidity. Uh, the money market funds, they bought up $145 billion or provided liquidity to the money market funds to keep them, uh, them going. And some other uh, different sorts of facilities that they, uh, that they put into place as you're looking at these actions that they, uh, they did. Uh, one thing that's interesting, again, is you look at these, look at the zero balances. That's, that's what's so fascinating about how the Federal Reserve did this. Um, uh, and, and all this lending is also... Um, Interesting, we, we call this, this kind of lending, they lent central bank money, which basically meant they, um, they, they essentially were, were printing this money, creating money when they were injecting all these funds in the economy, and then as the money wasn't needed anymore and was paid back, uh, those, those reserves essentially were destroyed or, or taken out of the, the system, all done um, relatively uh, successfully. Um, we have our quantitative easing program. I think Jose might talk a little bit about this. Right now, uh, they're, they're going out and buying up uh, a lot of U.S. Treasuries and mortgage-backed securities in an effort to keep interest rates uh, low, uh, something that's, uh, that's uh, still relatively controversial. Um, and when we're looking at what the Federal Reserve did, uh, there, there's, there's some big picture items, that I mean, big picture concerns you have when you're looking at it. Um, Yes, they, they saved, in, in, a lot of, in, in my mind and, and a lot of uh, uh, people believe they, they effectively stopped the U.S. capital markets and to a certain extent uh, global markets from completely melting down. Um, and, and we generally believe that was a good idea and that it was quite successful and it worked. Um, uh, there's some baggage um, associated. These are some of the issues that we end up facing as we, re, as we think about what the Federal Reserve did during this particular uh, time period. Uh, the big one is uh, moral hazard. It ties into this too big to fail idea. And it's the idea that in the next financial crisis, bankers won't be as careful because they know that if they, if they have the similar liquidity crisis environment that the Fed will step in like it did uh, you know, in 08 and 09 and, and save the day, and there's real concerns that by doing that, this will boost uh, the risks that they take and make them less careful and, and less, uh, and may actually lead to the next crisis as opposed to, uh, to stop these kinds of things. Um, I know Steve feels strongly about this particular issue and we'll be talking about it. A lot of these things that you're looking at, it, you have to weigh in the you know, questions when these, these agencies intervene in a way like the Federal Reserve did. Um, is the importance of saving the system and stopping all these institutions from, from failing, does that short-term concern override these, these bigger uh, questions that we're, we're looking at as we go through this? Um, uh, fiscal losses are kind of interesting. The, um, the Federal Reserve has never suffered any, well, historically, at least as of um, 09, had never had any losses in its business. It, it only lends on a fully collateralized basis, always gets paid uh, what it's owed. Um, clearly in some of these, this lending that they've, they've done, especially the non-banks, there, there, there are some losses that have been suffered, not, not very big. Um, one concern everyone has now is they've, they own a lot of, uh, of, they own a lot of U.S. Treasury securities, and they own a lot of mortgage-backed securities, and they, they've taken on an enormous amount of interest rate risk when, the, when they're doing that because if, if interest rates were to suddenly spike up, uh, these uh, U.S. Treasury securities and mortgage backs would be worth less because they, they, uh, they're yielding a relatively low, uh, low rate of interest. Um, 
and the um, the actual losses the Fed could suffer if, if there is some big spike in interest rates could could uh, could be enormous. So we're looking at this. Um, we talked a little bit about the balance sheets ballooning. We talked a little bit about that this morning. Uh, the Fed's balance sheet has essentially doubled, maybe tripled in size. It's gotten to be very, very large. In other words, they've, they've, they've bought a lot of assets. They've made a lot of loans out there that historically they've never made. And it, 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 it turns them into a big elephant, essentially, in the economy. It makes it difficult for them to... They, they have a goal of not only promoting economic growth, but also of uh, controlling inflation. And as they get really big, it makes them harder to, uh, to execute on their, uh, their monetary policy uh, goals and, uh, and duties that they have. Um, the the story is interesting because the Fed intervened in a way that's never historically been done. We're talking, you know, 500 billion here, 300 billion here, 200 billion here. Happy ending. All of the uh, all all that money was repaid back to the Fed. The reserves were taken out of the system, and and no inflation. You know, usually when the Fed, when central banks intervene in this way and print uh, that much money, it's usually inflationary. Sometimes hyperinflationary. We've had historically uh, almost no inflation, which which was probably due to the fact that there wasn't any spike in employment. I mean, we didn't have the traditional growth problems that that often trigger inflation in those kinds of of an environment, but but very very interesting that that they were able to maintain the liquidity of all you know basically were able to lend money to institutions that, that couldn't find any credit and, and kept them uh, operating and uh, and solvent and and they were and then when capital markets returned to normal conditions and they were and these institutions were able to borrow on their own they were able to take back all of that liquidity and uh, almost got a free pass to. Uh, to a, to a certain extent, uh, when you're when you're looking at uh, at what went on, um, it, you know the the one the one big issue, as I mentioned, is that um, these quantitative easing programs haven't they haven't exited those yet, and and they're determined to keep interest rates at a low level, which is which is where you, when you see them out in the market buying up uh, tens of billions of dollars of treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities. Uh, Every month, and um, we don't know when that's going to stop, and uh, and we haven't quite figured out what the effect of that's going to be, and so it's um, it's all very very complicated. One of my favorite adages is if you if you think it's easy, you, you probably don't understand it, and, um, and 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 but but I think this is a this may be a, a, an interesting case example of where a uh, an agency. Uh, that was directed by very smart and um, and uh, aggressive individual who recognized a problem that he thought was uh, was extremely serious, exercised the uh, absolutely to the outer bounds of his power in an effort to uh, to resolve these these kinds of things. Um, we've uh, we've put some curbs on the Federal Reserve, especially on lending directly to private companies. So I, I don't think the Fed would be able to lend. AIG and Bear Stearns, like they um, like they did before. Uh, there's been some st statutory changes that are powers that would stop them. I don't think though they, I think they probably could repeat though their effort at lending to banks directly and and intervening in the in the uh, commercial paper and uh, and money market uh, situations. Um, and so it's uh, you know as we look at these uh, these extraordinary times, it's uh, it's uh, it's fascinating to. Uh, to try and figure out what should be the limits on uh, on these particular institutions, I, I don't have a lot of answers. Um, I, I uh, you know, my my, uh, my only response, kind of, is how I started, is, is I'm I'm glad that the the person in charge of the Fed was as uh, was as astute and knowledgeable, and um, in my mind had a great deal of integrity and was able to push forward things that were very politically unpopular when he was doing them. And and it worked out terrific. You know, he he achieved the goals he wanted to. The uh, a lot of these uh, these a lot of this money that was printed was taken back out of the system and uh, and and effectively uh, destroyed. Um, but the potential to to do this again is still there, and, and it's something that we need to really think about as a, from a policy uh, standpoint. So thank you very much.